Welcome back. In the first episode I mentioned that all notions of computation can be seen as M programs for some type constructor M. Now that we know about monads, I can modify my claim to all notions of computation can be seen as M programs for some monad M. Recall that an M program is nothing but a function from some type T1 to M of T2. This kind of function is also called a Kleisley arrow, because for each monad M there exists a category, fittingly called the Kleisley category, in which these are the arrows. If you remember, I really like the fact that we could compose functions in the rich collection of types. In the same way, it would be nice if the Kleisley arrows also composed. The nice thing is, we already know how to compose Kleisley arrows. The composition of f and g can be obtained by using join and map. Through these, we give the definition of what's called Kleisley composition, which is represented in Haskell as that weird arrow thing. What Kleisley composition does is, well, it takes two Kleisley arrows and returns their Kleisley composite. Using this function, we can easily compose any two computations. Let's see an example in Haskell. Once again, we want to read a line for standard input and print it out, adding is great at the end. Basically, what this snippet is doing is taking two functions of type t1 to io string and string to io of unit and concatenating them to obtain a function of type t1 to io of unit, which reads the line and prints it, adding is great at the end. When calling this function, we must provide an argument of type t1. Any argument is fine since it will be ignored. In this example, I use unit as such an argument. As you can see, using class decomposition is a bit more symmetrical and satisfying than using join and map directly. But still, it's a bit cumbersome. In fact, both using join and map and using class decomposition are not very idiomatic ways to use monads in Haskell. The most idiomatic way to compose computations in Haskell is the bind function. This function is, to me, not as intuitive as the class decomposition, but in some sense it scales better, easily allowing to make long pipelines of concatenated effectful programs. It is a way to apply a class of the arrow, the second argument of the function, to a value that is already wrapped inside a monad, which is the first argument of the function. Our usual example now looks like this. The second argument is a function from string to IO of unit. However, the bind operator allows us to apply it to an expression of type IO of string, such as getLine. Of course, bind can be implemented in terms of the classic composition. Take your time to understand why the following works, if you want. If we wanted to compose more than two programs, we could combine different binds as follows. This is handy, but compare this to, say, Python. Quite a difference, right? If only Haskell provided a way to write a long composition of effectful programs in a way that is this concise and readable. Alright, of course it does. It's called the do notation. A program like the one above can be written in do notation in a simple and concise manner, which is basically syntax sugar for the version using bind. Alright, before closing I'd like to show you one final example on how to use monads in Haskell. We've basically only shown how to use monads to print, but printing does not have a return value. In order to understand how to work with return values, let's write a function that reads two numbers from the standard input and returns their sum. This is the version that uses bind. In the first line we define a function that takes a string and passes it, reading an integer from it. In the second line we use the expression getLine, which has type string. Of course, what this does is it reads a line from the standard input. We then use the bind operator, applying a function of type string to io int to the line we just read. Such a function is, once again, a function that reads a line and applies to it a function of type string to io int. Only this time, the function takes a string as an input and returns the sum of the two integers obtained by passing the two lines wrapped in the io monad. If we wrote the last line like this, it would have not been correct, because this function has type string to int and not the required string to io of int. To fix this, we apply the function return, which, if you recall from the definition of a monad, is the function that wraps an expression into the monad. Here is the equivalent code written in do notation. Looking at it, it looks almost exactly like an imperative program. This means that you can basically program in Haskell without thinking about monads all that much. By the way, the arrow pointing to the left in the do notation is used to save 
the values we get from the standard input in such a way that we can refer to them in the final part of the computation. I really hope that this short series clarified some of the main concepts surrounding monads, and that you're not more confused now than you were before watching it. If you need any clarification about any part of the series, you will find me in the comments.